Kia ora, and welcome to our fourth remote sensing webinar this week. Today we lift our vision from the individual pests that we looked at yesterday to see how satellite imagery can scan the habitat and help get ahead of the curve for predator control. Ben Jolly is a remote sensing researcher at Manaki Whenua and leads a team of specialists delivering a range of perspectives on our landscape from satellite, aerial and LIDAR tools. I'll be back at the end uh, for Q&A and now over to you. Thanks Christine, kia ora everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about beech tree flowering um, and how we detect that in order to help dock better target predator control efforts. So the core problem that we need to tackle, um, and I find it's often helpful to remind myself of this when I'm starting to get dragged down in the myriad of many other problems, is that stoats and rats are eating our native fauna. Um, and one of the drivers that we are investigating as part of this uh, is beech trees and the beech tree reproductive cycle. So beech trees flower and produce seeds every year, but the intensity changes year to year and we get occasional or semi-regular highly productive masting years that produce a lot of flowers and seed and uh, mice and rats come along and eat these uh, which then causes a secondary explosion in mustelid or stoat uh, primarily populations which is okay until the seed is gone and then they all switch to native birds and animals. So uh, the Department of Conservation obviously needs to try and control these predator populations and specifically they would like to know uh, in advance where the areas of heavy beach masting might be. So there are about 4.1 million hectares of forest in Aotearoa where beach trees are present um, and so that's a lot of a lot of area to cover um, and a map of flowering intensity over areas of this forest would be useful for DOC to help them figure out where in that vast expanse of forest they might want to try and target predator control efforts. Uh, but also they want to know if it's masting at all because you do get years where not much happens and then you get years where a lot happens in certain places and then you get years where a lot happens everywhere. So if we can try and find this masting um, and do it at national scale or find the flowering and do that at national scale uh, in springtime, then we can try and get that information to dock uh, well in advance of when the seed starts to fall in autumn. Uh, the current methods that dock have of trying to predict where there'll be heavy masting is the delta T uh, temperature method. Uh, so that looks at the temperature of the previous two summers um, and that, that varies where you are in the country. And so if you have uh, particular warm summers, then uh, that's a good predictor of uh, heavy seed fall in the autumns. Uh, but that's only a predictor, it doesn't sort of detect anything. Um, and if they wanna see where the seed is heavy, they have to start looking at seed rain data after it falls or potentially using helicopters to take clippings from trees uh, while the seed is still on the tree. But all of that happens much later um, with uh, less lead time to figure out where to do predator control. The flowering is very visible from the ground. Um, there's a red or rust colour. So the theory is surely this should be visible from space. So to try and do this, we looked at Sentinel 2A and 2B. Um, so multispectral imaging. Uh, so there's a push broom sensor. So it uh, basically uh, flies over the country and continuously uh, records pixels as it flies instead of a frame camera where it just takes an image it sort of builds it as it flies over the country. Um, we get five daily repeats um, of each pass and the country is covered by several passes some of them overlap so if we're lucky there's certain areas we get an image every two or three days. We've got data since 2016 and it's a 10 meter by 10 meter pixel. So uh, as a matter of course, at Manaki Whenua, we already process and archive all the Sentinel-2 data for New Zealand. Um, and our colleague James Shepard was talking about this on Tuesday, I think. Um, so this study uh, used all our available images over the indigenous forest estate. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the cloud masking that James was talking about on Tuesday was uh, particularly helpful for this study. Uh, the processing was only really possible because we have access to the Nessie HPC um, 
both for storage and just providing the sheer number of core hours uh, that we need to try and analyze all this data. So here we can see a series of images starting from the beach flowers in your hand and then started slowly zooming out um, from under the canopy and then uh, looking across a valley uh, to an aerial image to a Sentinel-2 image. Um, and as you can see, as you start zooming out, it gets harder and harder to see exactly what's happening because it's not what, sometimes you get large areas of forest. Um, other times you get large areas of forest with sporadic trees uh, flowering. Um, and even uh, sporadic flowering over a larger area can still uh, introduce a significant amount of seed or a significant amount of food for predators. But the reality when you start looking at this um, is that it is a little bit harder even than that to detect. So this is uh, three images or three different dates of imagery over a, a single area um, in the Kaimanawas. And uh, I'll give you $10 if you can figure out uh, which one is the masting image just from this. So this is from 2022. Uh, and uh, as you can, well, not quite so obviously see just yet, um, the masting image is in the middle. But if we enhance it uh, or modify the stretch of the imagery, it becomes a little bit more obvious. Um, and you can see that, uh, well, one of the issues we have to contend with is that masting doesn't hang around for very long. The flowering tends to only last maybe two, possibly four weeks max. Um, so the 22nd of October was a very good image that we had over a lot of the country. Um, but by the 1st of November, um, so not even two weeks later, um, you can see a lot of the effect is already gone. And in middle of September, there was nothing happening as well, um, but still a few clouds hanging around. It's also worth noting uh, that yeah, cloud cover is a significant problem. And uh, these three images, I think, were the only really usable images over the Kaimanawas for uh, September, October and November. Um, so that would be what roughly 20 something images total, but there were three of them were the most usable and cloud free. So because beach flowering is not consistent year on year and we have access to temporal satellite data, we can uh, look at all of the years of data we have for beech trees um, and then figure out what they normally look like, uh, which will be a non-flowering or non-masting year. Um, and then try and calculate the difference for each year uh, to figure out if heavy flowering is happening. So there's uh, two key things needed for this approach. Uh, we use an index, a bit like NDVI, but we call it the normalized difference yellowing index, um, which just uses the red and green bands. And then we model that using a series of uh, inter and intra-annual sine and cosine terms. Um, so this gives us, I think, five values uh, per pixel and we do this for you know about 410 million pixels so it's a it's quite a large amount of data and quite a lot of computation so what this looks like per pixel is uh something like this uh we have the red dots are the the ndyi values um for a given pixel over a, over a time series um and then the blue line is the modeled curve and you can tell this quite a lot of uh noise or at least variation in the data um, year on year. But if we're only looking in springtime, there's uh, light or no flowering slash masting in 2016 and 2017 in this example, but uh, quite a lot in 2018. And if we uh, subtract the curve from the observations, then it becomes a bit more obvious as to what's, uh, what's happening during springtime uh, in a year where there is a large amount of masting. So when you apply this to all the pixels, um, this is an example clipped out near Tiana um, and from 2018. And you can see uh, down here, there's quite a lot going on, which translates into a higher NDYI value. Um, and then when you analyze all the images from a given spring, uh, it gives an indication of flowering intensity. So this is a, a single date on the left um, and then the same date in the middle but looking at the index and then on the right is a composite uh, looking at all the available cloud-free images for the spring. 
and at national scale it looks something like this um, but as you zoom in as you, there's an inset in here which is a Horden belly from memory um, and it's incredibly detailed so we, we run this at 10 metre resolution um, over the whole country and we've been running it every year for a number of years even this is a couple of years old we recently um, ran the 2022 one which hasn't made it into this slide um, and we are planning on running it again uh, this spring um, to help and hopefully not pick any up but uh, we might we might pick some up and then Doc might have some work to do uh, in 2024. So uh, we do pride ourselves on uh, trying to make accurate maps at Manaki Whenua um, and so we try to do an accuracy assessment on this uh, ground data is a little bit difficult to come across, um, especially spatially accurate ground data, which you need very spatially accurate ground data to compare it to satellite data like this. Um, so we compared our method uh, versus manual image interpretation, and overall we had an accuracy of 90.8%. Um, and we're, fit, we're pretty confident that if we detect flowering with this method, it is actually flowering. Um, we uh, missed some flowering, um, so it slightly underestimates, um, but we're confident that if we find it, it's, uh, it's correct. We're also experimenting with different forms of delivery rather than just sending through um, a raster or a vector file. Uh, so this last year I was uh, experimenting with using Google Earth Engine to um, present the data in a way that's easy for people to get a hold of and zoom around and have a look because uh, as you um, look through different zoom levels at this data, more and more detail becomes more obvious um, and there's quite a few nuances in there and it can be helpful uh, for us to be able to display the exact imagery that went into producing a map as well as the map itself in a way that people can toggle it on and off. So the lessons uh, that we learned as part of this, and I'm running a little bit ahead of time I think, uh, but uh, remote sensing is much easier if you already know what you're looking at, um, which sounds a bit stupid, but it is actually true. Uh, and one of the issues that we ran into is that uh, there was not a good map at national scale of where all the beech trees are. Um, uh, we know roughly where heavy beaches versus or, or beach dominated versus just beach present, um, but uh, the beach species are also important to know. Um, because the species look different uh, from you know, uh, mountain beech versus uh, red beech, for example, um, and they also flower differently. So the, the method we have of learning what a pixel normally looks like helps to account for some of that, but uh, life would be easier if we knew more about what we were looking at in the first place. Uh, in the course of producing this national map, um, we learned a very important lesson, which is do not train a model or develop an algorithm using only one area. Um, that's quite an easy trap to fall into. You spend a long time hanging out in a certain area like Te Ana, um, and you come up with something that works really well and then you run it nationally and you find it really doesn't work in the Horden because the species was different or the climate's different and things act differently. Um, or you might even be missing uh, potential flowering because uh, you haven't expanded your date window long enough, for example. And a lower accuracy map at national scale can be more valuable than a highly tuned one for a couple of valleys. And again, this kind of comes back to the second point, um, especially if there isn't a map in the first place. Um, sometimes it's better to accept 85% um, rather than uh, keep trying to tune it more and more in one area and then finding that it makes it worse in a different one. And as part of building this, we did look at using the seed rain data from the seed traps, um, but we ran into issues with it. And one of them was uh, we didn't actually know where all the traps were. We had GPS locations for all of them, but some of the data wasn't quite adding up and we investigated it further. And um, some of those positions can be out by quite a long way. And especially when you're looking at uh, potentially sporadic flowering of trees in an area, it's quite easy to pick up a lot of flowering, but the trap's in the wrong place and doesn't collect any seed um, when you're looking at sort of a you know, one to two hectare area um, and vice versa. So it's um, 
yeah, there's a lot of nuances around the ground data. And yeah, finally, uh, pretty maps are easy. Pretty accurate maps are much harder. Um, it's e it's a, it was a lot easier to get something that looked right. Um, but when we actually started to investigate how accurate it was, it turns out it wasn't that accurate and we had to go back to the drawing board. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the New Zealand e-science e infrastructure. Um, we get this question a few times, so I might uh, try and hit it off at the pass, which is uh, why don't we just use the cloud? Um, our satellite and LiDAR, LiDAR archives would actually cost significantly more than our NESI investment just in storage per year on the cloud. Um, we've investigated this before, and but on top of that, uh, one of the probably the more valuable aspects is that NISI support, uh, hands down, I think the best science compute support group we've come across. Um, the infrastructure team are great um, and the consultancy team are also really good. And together those three teams are just, they provide so much value for science compute um, for us at Manaki Whenua uh, that, you know, it's, I've said there that they fill at least, uh, or they count for at least three very hard to fill FTEs if we wanted to sort of move away from Nessie. Um, but that's that, that still undersells it. The service is just amazing. So I wanted to say thank you to Nessie. So conclusions, heavy beach flowering is detectable using satellite imagery. Um, the window of detection is short uh, and can present difficulties with cloud, but if we can see it, we can map it. Um, and this work is now in production and feeds into docs planning for predator control efforts. We're planning on running it again this spring. Um, I just, well, I should mention that DOC don't, well, I hope they don't uh, solely rely on this map. Um, it's part of a suite of data they have, including the Delta T method still, um, and reports from people in the field, because again, you can't really beat ground data. Um, so this work was also made possible by the Advanced Remote Sensing of Aotearoa uh, MB Endeavour program, uh, which has uh, now wrapped up, but was, uh, pivotal and giving us the resources uh, to look at this. And thank you very much. So this is yeah based on a paper that was published last year, I think, which you can find at those uh, URLs and more information. You can either ask a question in the chat or uh, refer to the paper. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, that's really interesting stuff. And we have got some good questions for you. We're going to start with a couple of questions around other image sources and other satellites. So first first up, have you used data from other satellites to fill in the gaps where you might have cloudy cloudy images? Uh, we've looked at it um, and the uh, there's a unified product that incorporates Landsat imagery as well, um, which is uh, tempting. And if we have some more time and or funding because the program's run out, then we might look at incorporating that. We did also look at uh, Planet as a source of data, um, and we had a, a meeting with their sales team, but it was difficult at the sort of scale that we needed and the data requirements. Um, it was probably gonna be cost prohibitive. And that's one of the big issues is, and I guess one of the great things about having access to the Sentinel data is that uh, when you enter the world of commercial satellite imagery at large scales like that, um, it gets very, very expensive very quickly. Um, and so if there's a demand for it, then you might be able to find funding, but if there isn't, uh, then it's it's almost impossible to do the research. And Nash has asked a really related question to that, um, as to whether the model and the index that, that you've developed would be applicable on higher resolution imagery. Uh, I think it is. Um, the question is whether or not you would need to retrain the model on a different sensor um, and there's a there's probably a good chance that you would need to train it on a different sensor so we can't just take the coefficients from sentinel and apply them to planet for example as far as i'm aware i mean we need to uh, investigate that further um, but you would probably need uh, a record i should mention you need a, a, about three years worth of data um, with at least two of those years not being masting years in order to try and get a reliable um, model of a pixel. Uh, and the more years of data you have, the better, um, which is one of the reasons why it gets cost prohibitive pretty quickly. But again, if we um, have the opportunity, it would be great to try and 
uh, just drop in data from other satellites and see how the model goes with that. And I think another related question here from Will, would hyperspectral data help? Yeah, so this was, I should have included a slide about this actually. This was quite interesting um, because Sentinel-2 is a, it's, a, it's multi-spectral, I guess, but it does go up and well up into the shortwave infrared. Um, and I investigated all the bands, and uh, this is a, sort of a, a rabbit hole that was quite easy to go a long, long way down. Um, because as soon as you start looking at forest phenology and any combination of image bands, uh, you, you just keep finding more and more interesting uh, features. But it kept coming back to red and green. Um, which in a way was a bit annoying because it's sort of boring um, because it's just a, an RGB image. Uh, but those were just the most effective bands. Um, there was some really in interesting stuff happening in the red edge, um, but uh, there was also, that was complicated by the green flush that can come after a masting, but then, or after a flowering, but then also um, other species that weren't flowering having green flushes coming through and the red edge was triggering. So uh, we investigated it, um, but yeah, red and green was just the best. Great. Now, um, here's a question looking forward. You um, mentioned you've only just finished collating the 2022 data. What's the timeline between the satellite imagery being taken and the outputs being available for the decision makers at DOC? Um, so I guess I, I hadn't just finished it. Uh, we produced the map for DOC. Uh, it was, I think we gave them the final one it was in December of last year, um, or at least that's when it was ready to go. It might've taken us a little bit longer just to be sure we wanted to wanted to pass it on. Um, and if we run it again this spring, uh, yeah, anticipating it'd be ready by December, the final version of it, because um, the workflow is well set up on Nessie. It's a complicated workflow, um, but it's all, it's all coded now. Um, it's completely automatic. And so uh, we did, we get the imagery um, a day or two after it's uh, acquired. And as soon as we have enough imagery, we can run the, the analysis. Um, so we would probably run it twice just to see halfway through spring what's happening. Um, and then we'll run it again at the end of spring, sort of in early December um, and have an answer pretty quickly. Fantastic. And and kind of feeding back into that, that question, I think Ty has asked us um, how many images you use for each year. I'm picking it might be different, but. Yeah, it, it really depends on the cloud and that's why the automated cloud masking is so important. Um, because if we didn't have automated cloud masking, then uh, we would have fewer images to use because we'd have to manually um, find and then manually cloud clear each image and that would really limit what we could do. Uh, so yeah, it does vary year to year. We, it'd be in the order of, hoping for a dozen um, each spring. Uh, sometimes we only get three or four in a certain area. Sometimes we only get one, which is really frustrating. Um, but that's, I guess, one of the one of the things we can't get away from is that a lot of this forest is in heavily mountainous areas uh, and those tend to attract cloud. Um, and yeah, we just, just can't get around that. Um, not with the five daily acquisitions. We're lucky in that there's good chunks of the Southern Alps, especially around um, Tiano and I think the Horden that exist in areas of overlap between two uh, sentinel passes. And so we do get data every two to three days and that does help us get up to closer to that you know, dozen cloud-free images. But yeah, it's usually probably more in the order of um, four to six uh, in, in most areas and up to a dozen in a good area. Great. And I think we'll make this one our last question, and and it's another thought-provoking one. But what are what are the goals that you have for improvement of this um, technique or or work in this area? Um, and do you have plans for how how that will develop in the future? It would be really good to um, understand more about the spatial variability of the flowering. Because um, at the moment it's easier to pick up bigger chunks of it um, and isolated trees can get left out, um, but it'd be good to understand more about this, the, I guess the, yeah, the distribution 
of um, more isolated trees, but then also the impact that that has on, at the end of the day, the predator populations, because it might be, you know, that they don't have much of an impact at all if there's only a few of them, or it could be that there's lots. So it'd be good to know more about that. Um, but I think the main one, to be fair, is just trying to get more cloud-free data. And so that would be incorporating more satellite data, um, starting with that unified product, with including the Landsat data. Um, but then also, investigating the likes of um, of Planet or other uh, commercial companies and buying imagery um, because those a lot of those satellites pass over at least once a day. Um, the spatial resolution is, I think 10 meters is high enough. In, in a way, it's almost too high. Um, and yeah, this is definitely one of those cases where more resolution is not better. Um, because you just get stuck with too much spatial variability um, as you increase the resolution. So we want lower resolution, it's a bit easier to pick up the effect of the flowering versus just background variability um, throughout a forest canopy. Uh, but it's the temporal resolution that's really important. Um, so trying to get some more um, more satellite data in there is probably the, would, would be the thing that would help the most, I think. Great. Well, thanks for that, Ben. And you've uh, answered some tricky questions, and and uh, I think we'll we'll sign off from here for today. Um, thanks to everyone who's who's joined us today. Um, in our final remote sensing webinar tomorrow, Jan's going to dive into literally um, urban, forested, and rural landscapes to look at individual trees. So. I think a, a nice segue from what we've talked about today. Um, if you haven't already registered for tomorrow's uh, webinar, please uh, check the link that is on your follow-up email and there's still time to join, join the fun. But for now, um, over and out. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.